Tonight we're going to look at Romans chapter 12 and uh, verse number 2. Romans 12, look at verse number 2. He says, And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Now, a lot of Christians memorize verses 1 and 2 together. I beseech you, therefore, brother, by the mercies of God, that you present your body as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is a reasonable service. Then it says, and be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may be able to prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So here what we want to do is we want to prove the will of God. That's what you want to do as a Christian. Uh, you want to prove the will of God for your life. And the way you prove the will of God for your life is the same way you prove your work, the same way you prove the work of others, the same way you prove all things and hold fast that which is good. You do it the same way. You prove the will of God by looking at Scripture. Amen. Now, I could take you tonight uh, on all the places, especially in the New Testament, where the Bible says the will of God is. Yes. And there's at least a half a dozen times where the Bible specifically says the will of God is. Uh, one of them is that you abstain from fornication, sex before marriage. Mm -hmm. Abstain from it. This is the will of God, that you abstain from that stuff. Another one is that you abstain, that you, uh, the will of God is that you put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. Mm -hmm. Shut up those men that are ignorant in what they're preaching and teaching. How am I going to do that? By proving that what they're saying is false. Yeah, yeah. Make them look foolish. And that's why you need to prove your own work. So you aren't that foolish man that somebody proves to be ignorant. Yeah. And then you're like, uh-oh. But that's another Christian's job, according to the will of God, is to prove the work of others. See? And if your work it doesn't hold up the scripture, you're ignorant. You're foolish in that thing. So... We could prove the will of God for our life by going to the Bible to find all the times, and I suggest you do it. I suggest you uh, get an online concordance, an app that's a concordance. I use eSword, and type in the phrase will of God, or just type in the word will. Now, if you do that, you're going to get a lot more. So you might want to narrow it down to just the New Testament, filter it out just the New Testament, and then type in the words will and God and see... If you can find all the verses that have the word will and God, and you can find within that those specific verses that will say, this is the will of God. Again, there's at least a half a dozen of those. Those are biblical doctrinal wills for every individual Christian. Okay? So when you see the will of God is, that applies to everybody that is saved. Those are doctrinal wills for everybody. Now, when it comes to proving the will of God for your life versus the will of God for my life, well, that's different, right? Yeah. There yeah. are wills of God that are the same for him and the same for me. But then there are wills for Christians that are different depending upon the individual. Does that make sense? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, how am I going to prove that? Well, I'll prove all things. Hold fast that which is good. Mm -hmm. If it's not good, you can throw it out. If it's not good, you can throw it out. Yeah. That, that helps a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, if it's a good thing done the wrong way, that's not God's way. Mm -hmm. You throw that out. Hold fast that which is good. There's a lot of good things that are done the wrong way, and it's not God's way. God's not a half-hearted God. Yeah. Uh, whether it's your hot or cold, the lukewarm stuff, that sort of, I'll do the right thing, but I'll do it the wrong way, and then God has to accept it because, no. No. God's not a halfway and half out. No. Salvation is all in or all out. There's no in between when it comes. You can't straddle the fence on salvation. No, no. Okay, can't hedge your bets on salvation. You put all your chips in on Jesus Christ, yeah. and you get a full and you get you get a full reward for doing that. Yeah. Salvation, eternal life. So when it comes down to figuring out, and, and the thing is, is that you have to prove the will of God for your life. That's not my job. My job is not to prove the will of God for your life. Now, I can help you 
see some things that are good versus some things that are bad, and that helps weed it out. But the overall will of God for your life, who to marry, how many kids to have, which house to live in, which house to buy, uh, which state to live in, which car to buy, uh, how much to put in the offering plate, uh, how many, how many uh, hours you should spend reading your Bible, all those types of things, that's between you and the Lord. I'm not going to budget your life. I'm not going to run your life. That's up to you. You've got to know how God wants you to do that for your life. A lot of Christians don't want the responsibility that comes with proving the will of God. Now, if it's black and white, they don't mind that. It's very easy. There's about six of them in the Bible. They can find those. Okay, we got that. But the other kind of stuff, the stuff that's not concrete and stone for everybody, and i got to find it out between me and the Lord, that takes work. you got to work at that. you got to pray through that. You've got to discern those things. And so a lot of Christians aren't willing to put the work in, the discernment in, the prayer in, the time in, the walk in to prove that this is God's will for my life. And there are, like the Bible's not going to tell you which house to buy. It's not, there's no verse in the Bible that says you've got to buy this house on this street, pay this much for it. That's not in the Bible. So there are times when it comes to the will of God for your life that if you don't have a close relation, close walk with God, you're not going to hear that from God. Yeah. You're not going to sense that. You're not going to discern that. You are going to be like a wheat, a leaf blown in the wind, tossed to and fro. You will have nothing other than the flip of a coin for you to live your life on. You're no better than a rabbit's foot, than a lucky charm, than a rosary bead, or a crucifix around the neck. But you can know what job to take and what job to turn down. You can know what things you should buy and what things you should abstain from buying. You can know what things you should watch and what things you should abstain from watching. You can know what things you should listen to and what things not to listen to. Because God will reveal those things to you if you want to know them. Yes. Amen. Yes. Mm -hmm. If you want to know. He can tell you those things. Unless you believe like the religions of the world believe that God is up there. He's too distant. He's too far away. He's too abstract. He's too big and too mighty to care about the little things. Listen, God saved you because he wanted to reveal the little things to you. God saved you so you could have an intimate personal relationship with him. The problem comes is that the farther you get from him in your walk, the harder it is to discern and prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God for your life? So we say, how do I discern? How do I even begin? What do I begin? Well, begin with the Bible. Because there are concrete doctrinal wills. Get those down first. Because that will help you in knowing who to marry, who not to marry. Hey, preacher, this woman wants to shack up with me. She wants to, you know, she says it's okay that we can share the same bed. And there's nothing wrong with it. It's 2023. We can do these things. Well, I can say that's probably not a girl you should date. Why? Because the will of God is abstaining from that kind of relationship. Yeah. Boop, kick her out. <laughs> I preach, I met this woman and like, she is straight laced, man. She wouldn't hold my hand in public. She said, man, that's closer to the Bible. Yeah. I said, that's what you want to keep around. Yeah. But preacher, she likes that modern music. Whoa, now. <laughs> she might be straight laced on standards, but her music taste has got a lot lacking. Mm -hmm. Watch out. You see what I'm saying? So there are lots of places where the Lord will make things clear. But beyond that, let's say you let's say you got a Rachel and Leah situation. Mm -hmm. yeah. Jacob's got two women, a Rachel and a Leah. Both of those brought in the twelve tribes of Israel, yeah. right? Yeah. I mean, besides the other two that were yeah. thrown in the mix, you know, yeah. <laughs> the, the the servant girls there kind of helped out with that as well. Yeah. But Rachel and Leah, you couldn't go wrong with either one, brother Jim. One might have been prettier than the other, but one was more spiritual than the other. You couldn't go wrong with either one. How are you with? You can't have both. We're not Mormons. Amen. We believe in one husband of one wife, First Timothy chapter 3. That's right. One at a time is all you can handle. That's right. So which one are you going to marry, guys? You better have the Lord's wisdom on that. You better have the Lord's discernment. You better have the Lord's spirit on that thing. 
You marry for looks. Remember I told you before, she goes from a Coke bottle to a mayonnaise jar. <laughs> it, don't, it don't all stay the same. Ladies, it goes from a six-pack uh, uh, I mean, uh, yeah, six of abs to a six-pack of you know, beer or something. God forbid. Six-pack of soda. I don't know. Six, six bags of chips. I don't know. Is that what it is? I'm not condoning beer drinking. I'll have to edit all that out. <laughs> so you have to dis you have to have a walk with God if you're going to know these yes. things. Yes. You know, I mean, they, there's a lot of decisions. That not you know, one of the, I told you on Sunday, there's a lot of bad teaching out there. Just a lot of bad, a lot of bad colloquialisms that aren't biblical. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And one of the bad colloquialisms, one of the bad sayings that every answer to life's problems is in the Bible. Well, that's not true. Not every problem that you have, not every question you have is in the Bible. Right. What color should I dye my hair when, I, when it goes gray and I want to dye it? Well, probably better off not dyeing it. Let the gray show through. <laughs> but if you are going to dye it, I don't know. The Bible don't say what color hair to choose. Yes. <laughs> Which ice cream should I buy? There's not a, every question. is. The Bible says to avoid questions like that, really. Right. If you're that concerned about it, you probably should avoid it. If it's doubtful, it's dirty. But the Bible don't tell you how to govern every question for life. He gives you enough answers to the larger questions. But when it comes... But see, people want to treat the Bible like a Ouija board. You can't treat the Bible that way. You have to have a walk with God that tells you what to buy. Who to date. What church... What if you've got two churches identical? On doctrine, on everything. And they're two miles from down the road. Which one are you going to go to? The Bible's not going to tell you which one to go to. You've got to figure it out between you and God. That's a horrible thing, you know. Pastor, I got this lump growing on the back of my neck. What is it? I don't know. You better go see a doctor. The Bible don't tell you what that is. Pastor, should I do chemotherapy or should I do the wholesome diet to... The Bible don't tell you how to get rid of cancer. He don't tell you all that stuff. Now, he'll give you some things about diet and exercise, but he's not going to tell you which doctor to hire, get the knee replacement, don't get the knee replacement. He's not going to tell you that by just going and powering through the Bible. That's your walk with God that tells you those things. I know you want the preacher to say, Pastor, is every answer in the Bible or every... Answer life's questions found in the Bible. No, it's not. There's a lot of things that you are up against that there is no answer for. You've never seen it before. A man leaves his wife and his five children behind to fend for themselves. And she's saying, what do I do, Lord? Find me the, find me the story in the Bible that matches that description. It's not there. You might get as close as you can to it, but it's not there. So you have got to learn how to have a walk with God. And if God will show you anything out of his word, it would make sense to you in your situation. But it wouldn't make just sense just by plugging into the computer and saying, what do I do when? Oh, here's the answer. There it is right there. Yeah. Yeah. If anything, I'll give you an example. I had an opportunity one time to move and uh, to Hawaii. And... Uh, and I was on the precipice of going or not going. And I went back upstairs, and I, I think my mom was upstairs with me, and I was didn't know what to do, and I went up upstairs. Now, there's no verse in the Bible that says, move to Hawaii, don't move to Hawaii. That's not there. But the verse that was there that God did show me was, wait, I, wait on the Lord, wait, I say on the Lord. Now, that has nothing to do with going to Hawaii, folks. You better believe that. But on that particular moment, that was my answer yeah, yeah. from God. Amen. Now, that don't speak to you about a move when you read it tonight, tomorrow, the next day. But it might speak to somebody else who is, should I buy the iPhone 15 or not? Yeah. <laughs> Amen. Right? Yeah. Amen. Should I take this vacation or not? Yeah. Wait, I said, that could be the verse that God speaks to you out of. And it has nothing to do with an iPhone. But if you don't have a walk with God, if you don't have a relationship with God, he will not show you that verse, number one. Yeah. Number two, if he were to show it, you'd miss it a mile away. It wouldn't mean anything to you, right? It wouldn't mean anything to you at all. Right. You're over there trying to plug it into the computer. Yeah. 
Yeah. What should I, does the Bible say anything about buying an iPhone? You want every answer plugged into a computer and generated, spit out like an AI thing. That's not how God works. God is the artificial intelligence. God is not a concordance. God is not a dictionary or a thesaurus. God is a, a living, breathing, holy individual that saved individuals to make them holy, to make them walk with him. God's not going to be just treated that other way. So no, not every answer. But, but every answer can be given to you through Scripture and through prayer. Amen. So what's the problem? Why can't I get to the bottom of what, how, why can't I prove, the, why am I always looking for the will of God and never finding it? Why can I never find uh, the answers to the, the things that I'm trying to find answers to the, on, on what's God's will for me in this thing or that thing. Why, why don't I ever have peace about anything at all? I'll tell you the problem, and it's in the verse. Look at it again. How do we prove the will of God? How do we prove the will of God? Well, you better examine the thing. I mean, that's what proving means. Proving means to examine, to put under the microscope, to put through an extreme test. That's what proof means. So how am I going to prove the will of God? All right? It's time to put you through the test. Time to examine you to prove the will of God. Ready? Verse 2. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Why? That ye may be able to prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Hey, the way you prove the will of God is to examine your heart. The way you prove the will of God is what's going on up here as a result of that spirit that you've got about you. That heart of man that is above all things and desperately wicked, Jeremiah 17 verse 9, that very thing that drives a man to do good or drives a man to do evil, what is your spirit tonight? And if you've got a bad spirit, if you've got a bad heart, if you've got a bad walk, a bad mind about you, you are never going to prove the will of God for your life. You can't do it. So what God asks us to do is God asks us to clean up the inside. God asks us to filter out, to clean out, to make right. See, he says in verse 1, present your body as a living sacrifice, holy acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Mm -hmm. So God needs a holy vessel, a holy spirit within you, a holy mind, a holy heart, a holy spirit inside you in order for you to have the walk and the fellowship required to prove God's will in every aspect of your life. Mm -hmm. Now, if you want the truth, we aren't always that way. So because we aren't always that way, we don't always make the right decisions. Which customer I should take on, which customer I should let go with the wind because that's going to be more problem than good. Yep. Which maintenance guy to hire, which maintenance guy not to hire. Which construction guy to hire, which, which mechanic to hire. Listen, we oftentimes just jump into a thing and the vessel's not clean and the spirit's not clean and the mind's not clean. And so we make a mistake in our decision making. That happens. And then we say, why didn't I see it? Well, the vessel wasn't clean. Yeah, yeah. If you want a if you want to prove, if you want to prove the will of God for your life, you've got to have a vessel that is clean, that is sanctified, that is pure on the inside, so anything filtered through that thing can detect what is unclean. Yeah. Right? Yeah. The cleaner the thing is, the brighter the thing is, the easier it is to see the thing coming under the microscope. The easier it is to see the thing that is coming in for examination. The darker it is, the dimmer it is, the harder it is to see what's coming through there. So we just say, well, I think it's good. I think it's bad because I don't really know because I can't really see because I don't have my heart right. I don't have my mind right. My spiritual eyes aren't right. And when it's that way, when it's confusing, when it's not uncertainty, when it's unsure, when you're just not feeling right about it, you say, why is that? I should be able to because I'm saved. God's going to say, the vessel ain't right. Tell me to get some things right. How do I do that? First John 1, 9. We confess our sins. I don't know what to confess. 
confess anything you can think of in the last 24 hours. Amen. And say, Lord, if I miss one, God purge that out as well. Amen. So what he's saying is, he's saying that if you'll get your, in the context here, in the word here, I know the word heart isn't used, the word spirit isn't used. So the word that Paul, under inspiration of the Holy Ghost, writes down is the word mind. Which when you run the word mind, other places in the Bible, you will find that heart and mind and spirit and sometimes even soul are often, and strength at another time, those five words that oftentimes run synonymously. Now they may not all necessarily be the same thing, like the spirit is not the soul, the soul is not the spirit, because what's what will happen is we'll have a bad spirit about us and we'll allow bad songs and bad things to come in and the bad music and the bad spirit, oh, they love each other. But see, if that vessel is clean, the Holy Spirit's working in that thing. When a bad thing comes through, the Holy Spirit says, nope, that ain't good. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. And it's like that for everything. The stuff you watch, the stuff you listen to, the stuff you put in, the stuff you put out, it's got to filter through the right vessel. A holy, clean vessel. It's got to filter through the right mind. Like if my mind tonight is on uh, <coughs> evil things, bitter things, uh, vengeful things, angry things, upsetting things, it's not going to allow me to preach right things. I can't hear from God to know what to preach. And you can't hear from God what you've got to take care of if the mind is filled with junk. So you're trying, to, you're trying to take in stuff that is holy and acceptable and right, but it can't, it can't get there because of the other stuff that's there that's unholy, not acceptable, and not right with God. So you say, why don't I get it? Why can't I filter it? Why can't I make sense of it? Because your vessel's filthy. It's vile. In fact, the Bible in the Old Testament says, you know, in the Old Testament, they're under the law there, and when anything dies inside that vessel... If a weasel gets in there, or something dies, like a dead cockroach falls inside your vessel, you've got to, in some cases, break that vessel, or you've got to scrub it, clean it inside out with scarlet and, uh, and a scarlet thread there and blood. That's a type picture of the Lord Jesus Christ and His blood and our vessel and dead things. Listen, by going into a into Walmart today, you've got dead things all up inside you. Have an argument with the wife or the kids, you've got dead, dead, dead things in there. It's a dead spirit. It's a vile spirit. It's a foul spirit. You didn't lose your salvation, but you're upset. You're angry. You're you're tense. You're anxious. You're nervous. You're 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 you're, you're you know you you got those things that are that are peace and love and joy and things that are of the Holy Ghost. You have the things that that come out of the world. You pick up dirty things being in the world. And so if we just allow that stuff to accumulate, it's no wonder we don't know what to do. Yeah, I know. It's, good. it's no wonder when they have a special, we all run out and buy it. <laughs> Even though we ain't got enough money to put in the offering plate on Sunday when it comes by. But we got enough money to fill our, yeah. uh, our, our drawers and our fridges and all our, with all the junk. Yeah. And you never one time filtered it through God. But how do you know any of this stuff? How do you know what to wear, what not to wear, the length of your hair, the color? How do you know any of this stuff? If it ain't in the Bible concretely, that's your walk with God. Amen. That's your walk with God. So he says, be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. So you have to have, now we always point to the heart here yeah. and the mind here, where really the heart and the mind and that spirit is all here. Yep. The Bible talks about the bowels of man, like a bowl. Yep. This is what it is. It's a bowl. The inside of you is a bowl. And whatever you fill into the bowl is what stays there until you empty it out. If I put good, clean water in my bowl that doesn't have holes in it, I got clean water. If I filter, if I put in dirty water, I got dirty water in my bowl. And none of you would come up here tonight if I had clean water and there's a bunch of dirt inside of here and some gasoline and some Clorox and some Clorox bleach and I put that inside of a bowl and said, now come drink from that. Yeah. None of you are doing it. And yet we're trying to come into church and try to drink from a holy vessel, out of a holy vessel that's filled with toxic things. 
know what you got to do? You got to purge it. You got to dump it out. So the Bible likens the heart of man. We, we point here, we point here. Because that, that makes sense to us. The heartbeat here, the physical, the brain, the mind. That's how we kind of... But really, it's all here in the center of man. The Bible talks about the spirit of the Lord is like a candle that searches the inward parts of the belly. The Bible talks about the spirit of man uh, is wounded, the infirm spirit. That's all here. You feel it. Sucker punch, gut punch, right? Oh, God. Right? It, it talks about like, you know, you feel like you got sucker punched or gut punched. Somebody hurts you. Somebody hurts your feelings. Somebody backstabs you. Somebody, you know, uh, uh, Bla blasphemes your name or takes God's name in vain or you know you hear something dirty a dirty joke and you feel that thing here like a, like a queasy thing in your stomach like an uneasiness yep. that's the spirit of man that's where your spirit is yeah, yeah. that's where your soul is that's where all that stuff is it's in the bowels of man I don't call it bowels but uh, say it like bowl the bowls of man And so he says you got to renew your mind in order that you can prove what God's will is for your life. Let me say this before I forget. You cannot prove the will of God for your life if you are still conformed to this world and not transformed by the renewing of your mind. Because that's what it says. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed. It's the uh, polarities there. It's the negative. God always deals with the negative first. More times than not. Negative to the positive. Be not conformed to this world. Negative. Okay, more into the positive. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind. See, don't be conformed. What he's saying is, if you don't want to be conformed to the world, what? Then transform your thinking. If you don't, if you want to be less like the world, so you can have more of the filling of the Holy Ghost, because you can have more uh, understanding and discernment about God's will for your life, you can have more answers uh, quicker than others. How does that come? Don't be conformed to this world. Okay, that's what I don't do. But what do I have to do? Change the way you think. Transform your mind. Renew it. So the transformation takes place first. In the heart and mind, then it is manifested in your attitude toward the world. If you will take care of this thing here, the spirit, the heart, the mind, the soul. If you'll take care of this thing here, it helps to take care of those things out there. If this thing is right here, then your attitude, your conduct, your reaction, your feelings towards the things of this world will be more right than wrong. You'll be less like the world and more or less more like Christ so long as the mind has been renewed in a good way. Look at Ephesians chapter 4. Go right from Romans to Ephesians chapter 4. Say, Pastor, you seem a little worked up. You seem a little passionate. This is something that God has dealt with me about this week. Yeah, and it's so easy to, to backslide. The easiest yeah. thing in the yeah. world to do yeah. is backslide. Yeah. Yeah. Like if we're not living up to this verse, then we are backsliding. Oh. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. If we're not living up to Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2, then we are in a state of backsliding. Right. Now, I didn't say you were full blown out in the world, getting high, getting right. drunk, and yeah. cheating on your wife, and sleeping around and, you know, spending money on cars and women and booze and gambling. I, I, I know that. What I'm saying is if we are not up to the standard of what God expects out of us, then we have begun the process of backsliding. And so we can justify it by saying I'm not as bad as, but how long before you will lower the standard, lower the bar of I'm not as bad as? Like we already do that when we don't live up to the standard of the Bible. We say, well, nobody... Yeah. Pastor, nobody can live up to the standard of the Bible. All right, then why did God give it to us? Amen. Ain't nothing else to do on a Wednesday night but put the Bible together and give it to us? He gave us a standard. Right. And he's saying the ideal is to live up to the standard. And when God reveals to you that your standards are lacking, are slipping, and, you're not, and you've lessened and lowered the bar so you don't feel like you're backsliding... I'm trying to show you scripture tonight 
Jeff, Lord, to me, that be to you, on what it looks like and how we can get back to a place that is acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Yeah, yeah. <coughs> so it starts by renewing the mind. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 22. Ephesians 4, 22. He says that you put off Concerning the former conversation, that is the old way of doing things, the old life, the old man. Put off the, the uh, concerning the former conversation, the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts. Watch it. That's the negative. Put it off and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. So the negative is don't be conformed to the world. The negative is put off the former conversation of the old man. Hey, the way you acted as an unsaved man, as the old man's nature, put that stuff off. Say, what does that look like? All right, find the muddiest time of the year in New Hampshire. March, April. Ground is still soaked from all the melting snow. You might get a rain. And then just go out to a soccer field somewhere and do a full uh, wear all white, right down to your socks, shoes, wear all white, and then go running into that soccer field and head dive first into that sloppy mess and slide it up 25 feet. Get up and see what you look like. You know what you're going to look like? A dirty old man. <laughs> your old nature. So what am I got? You gotta go to church that way, you gotta go to school that way, you gotta go get married that way, you're gonna go to your doctor's office that way, you're gonna go to the dentist, you gotta go shopping that way. No. You're gonna put it off. You're gonna put it off. And then you're gonna take a bath. And you're gonna renew the day, renew. How you feel, because you feel sloppy and wet and gross and pucky and muddy. You're going to renew what you think about how you look by getting that other old stuff, dirty stuff off, getting a bath. Now you stand in front of that mirror and you say, I don't look so bad anymore. That's the walk you have with God. Now, sometimes, sometimes, we don't go full blown into sin. You know what I mean? Running, sin. <laughs> Some do go that way. They go all in on sin, man. They're like, I'm all in on it. Others kind of take little walks here and there in the mud. And they trip and they fall. They catch themselves, but their hands are dirty. And they kind of clean it off a little bit. It's a gradual thing. But they, don't, but they look at the guy who's all in the sin. They're like, well, my standard is that, so I'm not that bad. See? But you don't realize you got mud on your face. <laughs> You're a big disgrace in the eyes of God yeah, amen, in that amen. way. Let that thing cake on there, man. The harder, the more it's caked in the skin, the harder it is. Mm -hmm. You got to scrub harder. Get that brittle pad out. Yeah. Yeah. Just saying. That's the way the, the walk goes. And so... The spirit of the mind is, that's the spirit of man. That's the spirit of the mind. That's that, that spirit that God has given to everybody. And he's saying that the longer that spirit goes unchecked, uncleaned, unrenewed, the, the sourer, the fouler, the dirty that spirit becomes. And now it's hard to filter right things through an unclean thing. Right. So what do I got to do? I got to renew the way I think. The way I was thinking about the things I watched and the things I wrote and the things I listened to and the things that I ate or the things that I drank or the women that I dated or the men that I dated or the, the jokes that I told. All those things, I can't I keep losing that tonight. All those things can be filtered through. Well, it's just a part. No, it's going to be filtered through the Holy Spirit. God says, you got to work that stuff out. you got to clean that stuff up. you got to think differently now that you're saved. Yeah. And when we're confronted with that, it's like, oh, I don't want to think differently. Yeah, no. Be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Listen, the battleground is the spirit of man. Yeah, yeah. 
The battleground, the battleground is the mind of mankind. The the mind, the mind, a terrible thing to waste. Isn't that what they say? Yes. It is. But more often than not, we're wasting our minds by suffocating it, by dirtying it, by fouling it up with unclean things or unclean people, and allowing them just to stay there, and our spirit becomes foul and bitter, and then we wonder why. There's no direction in life. How do I prove God's will? I might want to start by changing the way you think about God's will for your life. Because then he says that you put on the new man. So you get rid of that old man behavior, renew the spirit of your mind, and then get and put on some fresh set of clothes. Put on the new man which after God has created righteousness and true holiness. Your behavior should match more of that than it does of the world. So the problem is the mind. The problem is the heart. So go to Ezekiel. Let me show you this and then we'll go home. Let me show you Ezekiel. And if you have Facebook, you already saw this. If you don't, you're better off or not. <laughs> You see how very little I generally post on there, but I do try to check it every now and then. Like I saw that Jim and Liz had a good time in San Antonio. You know, I got to catch up on your photos. You know, I think I was there with you. You know, that's a blessing. It's always fun to get those like unexpected, like right in the middle of doing something photos. You know, like. <laughs> One of those awkward photos, you know, <laughs> picking your nose and they got chit oh, no. <laughs> All right. Ezekiel 14. Now, the issue is the mind. The issue is the, the, the heart. The issue is that spirit of man. Mm -hmm. You can have a, a, a good spirit or you can have a bad spirit. And a lot of times that it'll be good or bad depending upon what we put in there. Now look at Ezekiel 14, verse 3. Son of man, these men have set up their idols in where? Yeah. These aren't idols that are set up yet on altars or on walls or in temples. These are idols set up in the heart. See that? The... the I think I said on I think I said on the post that the progression, I don't know what I should say, degression or progression, but the the way the thing goes is it starts in the heart. Once you start setting up idols here, you can hide it from everybody else. Nobody else knows the things that you an idol's a thing that you desire. An idol's a thing that you give uh, reverence to an idol is a thing that you give attention to. An idol is a thing that you worship. And so as long as nobody has seen me worship the idol of, you know, St. Augustus or, you know, the Virgin Mary, nobody's going to think that I'm worshiping idols. But long before you set up statues in your house or on your altar or your mantle or in your church, which we would rebuke, those idols are set up in our heart. They're our spirit. They're, they're, they are, the idols that we set up in our heart are things that we desire, things that we reverence, things that we want, things that we think about, things that we pay homage to, things that we adore or things that we give um, praise to or things that we give our time and attention to. That... Take away from the good things that we should be worshiping. Yeah, God is a spirit. And then the worship should worship him in spirit and in truth. Yeah. One preacher said it this way. I think it was John Wesley. Anything that cools my love for God is an idol. Yeah. That's a hard standard. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of things that can cool our love for God. Yeah. What happens, we start to set and accumulate those idols in our heart, and nobody else knows that they're there, but you and God know they're there. And you can justify it for a while, but eventually you begin to, you got so many idols there, or maybe you just have one, but it becomes a bigger and bigger idol, and it takes up more and more of your time and attention and worship and reverence, so the less time you have for church. 
the less time you have for youth group, the less time you have for men's prayer breakfast, the less time you have for the women's prayer things, the less time you have for a, a fellowship dinner on the grounds, the less time you have for reading your Bible, the less time you have for prayer in your house. Why? Because there's something else in you that is taking up more of your time. And it could be a job. It could be a career. It could be a woman. It could be money. It could be an attitude, a behavior, a thought. Anything that cools my love. Bitterness, envy, greed, covetousness, anger, vengeance. I'll get back. Those things can become idols. I'll get my pound of flesh. I'll make sure they know who they mess with. That makes the idol grow. It's a growing idol inside of you. It starts here. Now, watch what happens. And we all, folks, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I believe there is in every man a spirit within him. That if watered, if fed, if catered to, grows within us. Yes. It's always there. You're going to have dueling banjos, right? You're going to have dueling, you have a dueling spirit. You have the old man, the new man, and they are in conflict with each other. The old saying goes, which dog's going to win is the one I feed the most. That's the old saying. That's the way they thought of it. I think those were the Indians that said that. So they get it. You get it. So I believe that in all of us, there are idols that are just naturally there. In fact, the Bible says this in Ecclesiastes, he set the world in their heart. Every man here tonight always has a desire to achieve something. That's a man's desire. To, every man has wanted to build something uh, uh uh, grow something, see something come to fruition. Uh, they want to have a house. They want to have a career. They want to have a, 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 you know, the best looking wife, the best looking car, the best job. The, you know what I'm saying? That's that's the show off. Look at me. That's how man, God made man. And women's a, a little bit differently, but for her, uh, she she you know she wants to look pretty. She wants to she wants to sound nice. She wants to uh, make things look beautiful. She wants to you know, if she has a desire to be a mom, she wants to have the best kids and and the best looking husband and the best kept things and the the, the best of the this and the best of the that and the you know most of those pie making competitions aren't men, right, brother Mike? Ain't a bunch of dudes bringing their pies up to be judged. Well, nowadays it could be. I don't know. Men in skirt. It's usually, it's usually, men do chili cook-offs. Yeah. Women do pie baking things. Men do chili things. Hey, man. That's the way the thing goes. So God has set inside every man and woman things that, that are naturally predisposed for the world. Otherwise, we'd all be lackluster and boring Individuals who seeks nothing in life. Right? So what I'm saying is, what you have to do is you have to find out what things God wants you to have. What's God's will for your life so you get the right thing to come out of what he put there rather than the wrong thing because the right thing you'll praise God for. The wrong thing you'll praise self for or praise the world for. See? So, what I want you to see is that there, there's idols set up in our heart. But look, and put the stumbling block of their iniquity before their face. Then he says, should I be inquired at all by them? He said, if you've got idols in your heart, if you've got stumbling blocks before your face, why in the world am I going to let you know what my will for your life is? You heard that. You know? That's clicking. Why? Because we know that if God has a will for my life, he can only show it to me if my heart's right with him. I can't prove God's will for my life. I'm just shooting in the dark. I can't prove God's will for my life if I have idols set up in my heart because the idols are quenching, are in between, are separating 
my relationship, my fellowship, my walk with God, so my spirit ain't right, my heart's not right, my, 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 my feelings aren't right, my thoughts aren't right, nothing is right. So God says, you've got to clean out those idols. You've got to purge that vessel. You've got to clean it out. If you'll do that, I'll listen to you. I'll, 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 you come to me, and I'll, you inquire of me, and I will show you the things that thou knowest not. But if you keep idols inside there, listen, he'll hear you all day long, but he's not obligated to respond. So you're thinking, well, God don't care about me. No, he does, but he cares about the inside getting right than he does you accumulating more things to your resume, your pedigree, your bank account, your driveway. But what he says there, he says, not only have they set up idols in their heart, but then he goes on to say, Brother Jim, and set a stumbling block before their face. Now you can say it's like this, the idol's in the heart, and it's not long before an idol goes from being just in the heart to now it's on the table. The Bible says for men, not even to look at a woman with lust in your heart because you committed adultery with her already. You keep lust in your heart, you keep a woman in your heart, an idol of a woman in your heart, and it ain't long before married men are cheating on their wives. You think a man just cheated on his wife because he woke up one day? That's a good idea. No, he put too much work into the thing to see and destroy it. But he put the idol there too many times that when temptation presented itself, it was too easy. You think you think people just want to jump off into sin that way? No, they don't want to. You think children grow up to be the things that they that they become? No. But what happened? They set up idols in their heart. And never got it right because they were told you're too young to be able to confess anything. You're too young to repent. You can't know God's will for your life. You can't, we can't set up rules and standards because after all, you got to experience the world. And before you know it, they're full blown, whatever. What happened? It was here. Now, here's what I want to get to. That is how it works. It comes here. It festers, it grows, it builds, and eventually, blam, it's on the dinner table, it's on the mantle, it's in the temple, you're bowing down to it. Full-blown heretic, <laughs> idolater, idolater. But I began to think about it this way. What if the things that we put before our eyes draws the idol out? What if the things that we put, what if the stumbling block that is on the thing before our face, what if long before it becomes out of me, uh, it was drawn out of me by something I put in front of my face? Are you with me? Yeah. I got an idol in my heart. Now I got a stumbling block before my face. Now all of a sudden I'm buying the thing. I'm ordering the thing. I'm putting a credit card in. Mm -hmm. Huh? The idol's here. How does it go, Brother Mike, from being here to there? Well, sure, it might just come out. Mm -hmm. but, I, but I fear in this generation in which we live, because generation, listen, it was hard to put things in front of the face because TV wasn't always right. available. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But, Brother Mike, I think what's going on and I think all the things that are in a, in a man and a woman's heart, whether God put it there by, by natural birth or is, it was put there by, by a growing, festering desire, not getting those things purged out, but we keep it at bay, what makes it go full-blown? And I think it's how much time we spend in front of the things we put in front of our face. How much time I'm on. I think it's called, it's called a device. And the Bible says we are not ignorant of the devil's devices. I fear that the things that's drawing, the idols, the bad spirit, the bad heart, the things that are that's being drawn out of us to make us go off into sin Amen. are the things that we look at all the time. Amen. It could be the friends that we have yep. that we don't put them out of our every time they're in front of you, they're they're not they're not getting rid of the idol, they're helping the idol grow. Yep. 
And sometimes the idol is you. And they're telling you, you're the be the best person you can be, the, be the best version of yourself you can be. Woman power, girl power, man power, bro power. It's all you, 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 you. And they're pushing you to idolize you. And before you know it, you're like, yeah, it is all about me. You have just popped out your own idol. It's an image of yourself. Hello, Nebuchadnezzar. Built an image of himself. Yeah. Having he got there, somebody was telling him, "You're the best king. You're the best preacher. You're the best speaker." Oh, every time, every time you come around, oh, everything gets better. Everything is so much better when you're around, and you just begin to think it's all about me. Where's God in that? Yeah. Ain't that cool? My love for God's an idol. So people that we put in front of our face become a stumbling block. That now we are have a full blown idolatry in our homes. And the computer screens, and the TV screens, and the iPhone 15s, and all the stuff, and all the shows that we do watch, <coughs> festers a bad spirit in us. Festers a spirit of antichrist in us. The music we listen to festers a spirit of antichrist in us. And now we are just feeding an idol, and feeding an idol, and feeding an idol, and before you know it, you're no different than the world that we are not supposed to be conformed to. So how do I keep from being conformed to this world? How do I not become what I know I don't want to be as when I look at the world because it's a mess? Well, you better get this thing fixed. You better get it cleaned up. And the only way you're going to get that thing, this thing, wherever you want to put it, the way you want to get that thing cleaned up and get the right stuff back in is to be careful of what you're looking at. Because this thing here and those things there are all things that are never, really, they're never going to be for your good. Amen. And you might be able to get 1%, 2% things you can watch and feel good about. And I say, God bless it. But more often than not, that's a short span before we're like flipping over to something else. Yeah. Listen, I, I'm not saying anything that I'm not guilty of. This is my sin. This is my. This is. I'm just preaching a pet peeve, I guess. I'm just preaching something that I, that I think is there. So how do we get in the messes we're in? We have put too many things before our eyes, and our homes are a mess for it. Our churches are a mess for it. Forget the world. It's always been a mess. And the last point I'll make is: you want the proof of it? It's in the pudding. Adam's there with Eve in the garden. Yeah. It's one tree. Yeah. Yeah. And it's one fruit. And it's one woman. Yeah. And it's one command. Yeah. And it was one sin that plunged the whole entire human race yeah. under a curse. Mm -hmm. yeah. It didn't take 185 channels yeah. <laughs> or unlimited gigabytes of YouTube searches and Google searches for her to fall into sin. It was one thing dangling from a tree that she put before her face. It obviously was an idol already there because he said to her, ye shall be as gods. And the Bible says the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. Speaking right back to the things. He says, the taste, the touch, the smell, the things that you desire, you can have it. And she's got it before her eyes. And she's staring at it. Mm -hmm. And before you know it, that very tree, that very fruit, became the very stumbling block that the whole world has stumbled over yeah, yeah. as a result. Yeah. Yeah. Heavenly Father, pray. Help us tonight, Lord, I know.